Take your Bibles, if you would, turn to the book of Matthew, chapter number 10. Matthew, chapter number 10. It's so good to see each of you in the Lord's house this morning. I pray God will speak to your heart, and I mean that. When I stand to preach, my goal is really not to touch your head. That would make you smarter. My goal is really not even to touch your heart. That might make you more passionate, but my real goal is to touch your spirit. I pray that the sweet spirit of God would touch our spirit, and that would make us more spiritual. And that's what we want to leave. We want to leave saved and spirit-filled, and I pray that would happen this morning. I ask you a question while you're finding the Bible passage. What are you afraid of? Now, don't answer that out loud, because some folks have a long list. Many of us are afraid of a lot of different things, and, and that's all right, but most of our fears are largely unfounded. By that I mean most of our fears we'll never face. We're afraid of a lot of things that we'll never ever have to deal with. Most of the time when people think about fear in the Bible, they think about the fear not. So I have heard, and I looked it up once, but I don't remember the answer, but I have heard that there are 365 fear nots in the Bible. 365, they say, God gave us one for every day of the year. And as I said, I looked it up to see if that was true. I just don't remember what the answer is. Uh, so I'm not sure whether that's true or not. However, the Bible is filled with fear nots. However, the Bible is also filled with some things that we should fear. If you found your place, look at Matthew chapter number 10. Start reading with me at verse number 24. And let's read several verses together. Matthew 10, 24 says, The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, and hid that shall not be made known. What I tell you in the darkness, that speak ye in the light. What ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And are not two sparrows sowed for a fathering? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father, but the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are more valued than many sparrows. I want you to notice there's three fear nots in that Bible passage. You go back and look. The beginning in verse number 26, fear them not. The beginning in verse number 28, and fear not them the beginning of verse number 31, fear ye not, therefore there's three fear nots. I think God puts a lot of fear nots in the Bible because man has a tendency to fear the things that he should not fear. However, smack dab in the middle in verse number 28, about middle ways to that verse, there's one fear. He says, fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body. In hell. I think God puts commands for us to fear because man also has a tendency not to fear those things that he should. This morning I'd like to preach to you on this topic, five biblical fears. Five biblical fears. I'm not sure that I'll have time to finish the message this morning, but I'll get as far as I can because the Bible does teach us that there are some things we ought to fear. Let's start with prayer. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to preach this morning. And Lord, my heart is really full. It's a joy to have so many folks inside your sanctuary today. It's a special joy to have my daughter, son-in-law, and my grandchildren here. Father, it's not my goal to entertain. It's not my goal to teach. It's my goal to preach. And I pray that you'd give me that ability this morning. Help wipe away any emotions, any thoughts that I have. Might I stand strictly as the servant of Jesus Christ and proclaim the truth of the word of God. And if there's somebody in this place that has never trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior, may this be the day, the very hour, that they come to know you as their personal Lord. I pray, God, that your will would be accomplished, your work would be done, and we'll give you the praise, for we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Before we finish this morning, I'm going to direct you to several different Bible passages. If you'd like, you might want to pull out a sheet of paper and just jot down some of those. It might be a little bit easier than trying to find them all. But I want to speak to you on this topic Five biblical fears. God tells us there's some things we ought to fear. What should we fear? Number one on the list, we should fear God. 
Look back at verse number 28, if you would again. Verse number 28 says, And fear not them, excuse me, and fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body. The hymn that that Bible verse is making reference to is fear God. Uh, unfortunately, in the world that we live in today, there are many folks that do not fear God. Indeed, most people's image of God today, even preachers, the image they have of God is a big giant Santa Claus, a heavenly Santa Claus that listens and pretty well gives us whatever we ask because he thinks that we're pretty good people. However, the Bible has a different picture of God. God paints deliberately a different picture of himself in the scriptures. In the book of Hebrews, chapter number 10, verse number 31, the Bible says it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. Over a few chapters later in the book of Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 29, I think maybe God is explaining why it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God when he makes this statement, our God is a consuming fire. But the entire Bible paints God as a God that we ought to fear. The psalmist in the Old Testament writes these words. Listen to the pronoun in these words. It's Psalm 50, verse number 22. The psalmist writes, Now consider this, ye that forget God, lest I tear you in pieces, and there be none to deliver you. Notice the personal pronoun. The personal pronoun is, lest I tear you in pieces. That's God speaking. What's God saying in that verse? God could have described himself any way he wanted to in that psalm. But what God said is, now you need to consider this. Those that forget God, you need to consider, lest I tear you in pieces. <laughs> Rather violent and brutal image that God's painting of himself. Why would God do that? Because God wants us to understand we need to fear God. If you've got your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Revelation, chapter number 1. We actually talked about this Bible passage, I think, just as recently as last week. In Revelation, chapter number 1, God is reintroducing himself to John. Now, John's the writer of the book of Revelation. He's an apostle at that time. However, before he was an apostle, he was first a disciple. He walked with Jesus Christ for three and a half years. Walked with him. They ate together. They talked together. They served together. So John knew who Jesus was. Yet when Jesus was on this earth, he was veiled in flesh. He didn't come as the king. He came as the lamb. And now in this vision, John is seeing Jesus not in his earthly form, but in his heavenly form. So he's going to reintroduce himself. God is going to reintroduce himself to John, and he describes him in a rather powerful way, he describes him as a judge. Pick up reading at verse number 12, Revelation 1, 12. John says, And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one likened to the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and gird about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white as wool, as white as snow, his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Verse 17, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first. And the last. You know, it seems almost impossible to me that I didn't recognize who Jesus was introducing himself as for many years. For many years, I'd read through this Bible passage and I would know he's showing himself as somebody that John needs to see now, and I try to figure out who it was. And Jesus wears so many different titles. As I said, when he first came to the earth, he was the Lamb of God. That's definitely not the image of a lamb. So who is he presenting himself as? I begin to think the Bible gives him the, the offices of a prophet, of a priest, and of a king. Well, he doesn't look like a prophet. 
He's wearing a girdle that belongs to a priest, but the rest of it's just plain out the window. There's no royalty there. That's not the robes of a king. Who is he presenting himself as? Then one day it dawned on me, he's presenting himself as the judge. The judge. As a matter of fact, you go back and you look at some of what he is described as, and everything really points to the fact that in that verse, Jesus is the judge. It says he's got this golden girdle about his loins. That actually was wore by the priest, the high priest in the Old Testament. It's a picture of holiness. And it represents the fact that the judge, Jesus Christ, is a holy judge. And the Bible says his head and his hairs were white like wool. White in the Bible speaks of purity. Not only is he a holy judge, but he's a pure judge. It says his eyes were a flame of fire which means he sees all things. He knows all things. There's nothing you can hide from this judge. It says his feet was, as it were, burning in a furnace, fine brass. That means fiery feet. Fire speaks of judgment. Feet speaks, feet speaks of speed. He's a judge who is anxious, speedily going to carry out his justice said his voice was as the sound of many waters. That just speaks of his omnipotence, his great power. Here's the judge. He's the judge that rules over every, every affair of man. He's the judge that every human being will have to stand before. And in verse number 17, there's John, his disciple, his apostle, the man that walked with him for three and a half years. They had fellowship together. He laid his head on his bosom. They were friends. But the Bible says when John saw him as the judge, he fell at his feet dead before him. And then the Lord puts his hand on him and says, fear not. Why did he collapse? Why did he pass out? Why did he fall at his feet as if he were dead? He did it because he was scared. He was filled with fear as he saw Jesus Christ, the judge. You realize the first image that you and I ever see of Jesus Christ is going to be Jesus Christ, the judge. The first time we ever behold him, we're not going to behold him as the lamb. We're not going to behold him as the king. We're not going to behold him as the priest or as the prophet. When we first see him, we're going to see him as the judge. I tell you, God is to be feared. We're living in a world today where they have lost the fear of God. But unfortunately, it's not just the lost world that has no fear for God. The truth is I'm not sure even many Christians have a knowledge and a fear of God. You say, well, preacher, why should we fear God? There's no doubt he's awesome in his appearance. There's no doubt he's the judge. But why should we fear him? Well, the reasons to fear God are as infinite as God is infinite. But let me give you a few. Number one, I think we should fear him because we get smarter when we fear him. In the book of Proverbs, chapter number nine, the Bible says that the beginning of wisdom, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. In Proverbs, chapter number one, it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Well, knowledge and wisdom is where we get our smarts from. So that means when you begin to fear God for who he is, he's the omnipotent God, you'll become a smarter, a wiser, a more knowledgeable person. I think America for the last 50 or 100 years has been trying to test the reverse of that. The less you fear of God, do you become dumber? <laughs> Uh, if, if the more you fear God, the smarter you become, is it possible that the less you fear God, the more foolish you become? I think we can turn that experiment off. I believe it's already been proved without any shadow of a doubt. For this country has become more and more foolish and idiotic with each passing day that they have failed to fear God. Why should we fear him? Well, it'll make us much smarter people. Then again, I think maybe we should fear him because... If we fear him, I believe we'll quit fearing all the other things. I think back to that passage in Matthew chapter number 10, fear not, fear not, fear not. Three fear nots, only one fear. The middle of verse number 28, when we fear God, we learn we don't have to fear 
all these other things. Now, don't get me wrong. I understand there's such things as phobias. There's such things as fears. There's such things as panic. I have friends. I know people that deal with those kinds of things. But the more that we fear the Lord, the less we need to fear anything else in this world. I, I made a list. I'm good about lists. I have to make to-do lists and other kinds of lists. I made a list of some of the things that came to my mind rather readily of things that people fear. Let me give you the list. We're afraid of sickness. We're afraid of being asked to do something, of losing a job, of making a commitment, of an IRS audit, of a meteorite falling to the earth, of criminals, of pollution, of overpopulation, of climate change. We're afraid of the Democrats being in charge. But then again, we're afraid of the Republicans being in charge. <laughs> We're afraid that someone else will get our job, that we'll say something we shouldn't say. We're afraid of losing our mate. Some people are afraid of not losing their mate. We're afraid of our children growing up, of germs, of war, of AIDS, of pain, of failing a test. We're afraid of our children coming back home. We're afraid of staying where we are the rest of our lives. We're afraid of cancer, of too much sun, of too little sun, of too much salt, of too little salt of the next economical turndown, of rising prices, of losing their sight, of losing their hair, of gaining their weight. We're afraid of what we look like. We're afraid of what we will look like. We're afraid that we're not fitting in. We're afraid of marrying the wrong person. We're afraid of not getting married at all. We're afraid of being in style. We're afraid of being out of style. And most of all, we're probably afraid of what people think. We're afraid of almost everything that you can imagine, except we really don't seem to be afraid of God. Why should we be afraid of God? Well, we should be afraid of God because that'll make us smarter. I think we should be afraid of God because it'll help us to overcome our other fears. But I, I think that the primary reason we ought to be afraid of God is because He's going to be the one who determines where we spend eternity. He is the judge. Every person sitting in this sanctuary right now Every person that you have ever met, every person that you ever will meet, every person that's ever lived on this earth, every person that ever will live on this earth is an eternal soul. Every single one. And every single one is going to live forever someplace. I don't know about you, but when I come into the presence of the one who's going to decide where I spend eternity, I think it would be wise to have some fear when I enter into his presence. There are five biblical fears. What's the first biblical fear? The first biblical fear, we ought to fear God. What's the second biblical fear? The second biblical fear is we ought to fear hell. Go back to the text, if you would. Look again at Matthew chapter 10, verse number 28. That's turned out to be the key verse of this message. In verse number 28, he says again, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear Him, God, which is able to destroy both soul and and body in hell. Now, that verse is making it very plain. The one that we ought to fear is the one who's the keeper of heaven and hell. That's God. We ought to fear God. But implied in that verse is we ought to also fear hell. We fear God. Why? Because he's the keeper of this awful place called hell. Therefore, it makes sense that we ought to fear this place called hell. Somebody might ask, Preacher, why should we fear hell? I can give you lots of reasons, again, why you should fear hell. One of the reasons that we ought to fear hell is because of the reason it was created. There's only one reason why the place hell exists. There's only one reason why the place hell exists. It was created by God as a place to torment those that rebel and reject God. I want to say that again. It was created as a place by God for those that reject and rebel against God. When God created the place, the, the, the intended inhabitants was to be the devil and the angels that knew God in all of his glory and all of his splendor and yet chose to reject him and to rebel against him. It was created with them in mind. But then when Adam and Eve sinned, it just made sense. Same crime same punishment mankind did what the angels did therefore mankind must endure the same penalty as the angels that have fallen will endure now I'll be honest I don't like to preach on hell 
I just soon strike that word from our vocabulary. Many people today are writing Bibles and leaving hell out. Many preachers are preaching what they call salvation and they're not talking about sin and they're not talking about hell. But the truth of the matter is you really can't omit that message. If you omit that message, you also eliminate the reason why there needs to be a salvation. There's got to be a hell, there's got to be sin, or there's no purpose in a Savior and there's no purpose in a salvation. Without the awfulness of hell, you won't understand the splendor of heaven. So as much as I would rather not preach on the topic of hell, I must tell you, it's a place to be feared. Why? You won't be entertained in hell. You won't just be kept in hell. You will be forever tortured in hell. Why should I fear hell? Because of its intended purpose. Why should I fear hell? Because of the terrible things that happen in that place. I, re I really don't like to talk about those things, but as I was reading through the Bible, several thoughts, unusual things, really impossible things came to my mind about this place called hell. It's a place where the worms are forever eating, but they're never full. It's a place where the fire is forever burning, but destroys nothing. It's a place where the bodies of those that are there are forever dying, but they are never dead. It's the place of impossibilities. It's impossible for a worm to eat forever and never get full, but they do there. It's impossible for a fire to burn and yet destroy nothing. It's impossible for a person to be forever dying and yet never experience death, never to stop dying. And yet you take those three things and you tie them together in a bow and you've got what happens to lost eternal souls who do not accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. Third reason why I think we ought to fear hell is because there is no escape. I really didn't want to preach this message this morning. I've been thinking for the last week or more what I'd like to preach this morning. Uh, on, on a good week, God lets me have several thoughts, several different Bible passages that bounce around in my mind of potential sermons, potential topics. And I like it when there's several. <laughs> I like it when there's something to choose from. But I began to work on the text that I wanted to preach on. It was really from Genesis chapter number 6. It was about the flood. And that's what I wanted to preach on. As a matter of fact, I really thought I might preach on it until early this morning. The Lord said, no, you can't preach on that. And he gave me this particular message. But I've been thinking about the flood all week. You realize the flood was the greatest catastrophic event outside of the fall of man that's ever happened to this planet. In one swoop of judgment, God literally swept, I'm going to say, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, into the doorways of hell. Now, we really don't know how many people were on the earth when the flood took place. In Genesis chapters 1 and 2, we've got the creation of man. In Genesis 3, we've got the fall of man. By Genesis 6, God says, man's so bad, I'm going to wipe him off the face of the earth. And all except for eight souls were eliminated by the flood. That's only the space of three chapters, from chapter 3 to chapter 6. But it covers a time period of well over a thousand years. Man lived a long, long time during those years, some as old as 900 years of age. You're going to have a whole bunch of kids in 100 years. So we don't know how many folks were on the planet when the flood took place. Hundreds of thousands, maybe millions, maybe multiples of millions. But when that flood hid in the time space of less than 40 days, every single soul that was on this planet, except for the eight that were on that ark, were carried instantly into the doorways of hell itself. That's been somewhere around 5,000 years by man's guess. 5,000 years. Do you realize in that 5,000 years, not one of those souls has found a way to tun tunnel underneath the gates of hell. Not a single soul has found a way to climb over the gates of hell. In those 5,000 years, not a single soul has found a way to burst through the doorways of hell. The truth of the matter is in 5,000 years, not one soul has ever found a way out of hell. Now get this, what's really sad is they never, ever will. Not only have they not found a way out of hell, but in those 5,000 years, in all of those 5,000 years, not one single soul has found one second, one moment, even one twinkling of an eye's worth of time, of peace, of comfort, of ease. 
in that entire time period for every single second, no matter how many ways you want to divide it, they have always endured torment. And what makes it even worse is, no, long, no, no matter how long forever is, they will forever experience the awfulness of hell. You say, preacher, you're pe painting a pretty grim picture of that place. I'm trying my best. The reason I'm trying so hard is because you need to understand that hell is a place to be feared. It's a place to be feared. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you ought to lay awake at night sweating, sweating, palpitating, your heart racing over the awfulness of this place called hell. You say, preacher, are you trying to frighten us into <laughs> accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior? Well, I must conclude that's what the Bible is trying to do. You realize the Bible speaks more of hell than it does heaven. Why does God do that? Why does God speak more of the awfulness of hell than he does the joys of heaven? The only thing I can figure out is because sometimes it's easier to frighten people away from wrong than it is to entice them to do right. Many of you in this room this morning are parents, maybe grandparents. And you know that when you tell your children to do something, that it's really the best thing for them to do. You tell them to pick up their toys. You tell them to brush their teeth. You tell them to go take a bath. You're, you, you're really, you got a thousand reasons, a thousand good reasons why you're enticing them to do those good things. But if you've got a kid, you know sooner or later, uh, you can't always entice them. Sometimes you have to frighten them with the wrong. And, and, and that looks like what God is doing when he talks about hell, he's showing us how awful this place is. Heaven is a beautiful place. He's enticing us with the good, but he knows that some people are just dead set on stubbornness. And if I could say, stupidity. And that the only hope for their soul is to frighten them with the reality of hell. So I say again this morning, there are some biblical things that we ought to be afraid of. What should we be afraid of? Number one, we should be afraid of God. Number two, we should be afraid of hell. Number three, we should be afraid of death. We should be afraid of death. Now, to be honest, that's one I don't have to coax you on very much. Most people already have a pretty good fear of death. However, most people fear death for all the wrong reasons. Most people fear death because in their mind they think that's the end. They think that's the game over. That once you get to death, it's all said, it's all done. That's the finale. We've finished. Other people feel, fear hell, hell, excuse me, feel death because they don't know what takes place on the other side of it. It's the unknown that kind of frightens them. And then other people fear death because to them it's lonely. A death is one thing we must all do by ourselves. It doesn't matter if you're in a room and a thousand other folks are dying at the same moment. You face death alone. For these reasons and others, people already fear death. However, I want you to know those are all the wrong reasons for which we should fear death. To begin with, if you're a Christian, none of those things really apply to you anyway. When you as a Christian die, I promise you, you won't die alone. <laughs> The Bible tells us in the book of Psalm, chapter number 23, that the Savior, the Good Shepherd, is going to meet you on this side of the valley of the shadow of death. And He and you are going to walk hand in hand and arm in arm through that valley together. You won't be alone. You'll never know what it is to walk through death's valley alone. And then again, we all who are saved, we have some idea of what's on the other side. It's not a big unknown for us. The Bible gives us many details of what this place called heaven is. And eternity is all about. And by the way, what we don't know, we know the person who's in control. And we know that it's only going to be better than anything we could imagine. And then again, I hope we all know that nothing ends when we die. It's not game over. It's game on for the Christians. We're in the middle of football season. It won't be long before the Iron Bowl cranks up. If you're not from Alabama... You may not have an appreciation for sports and for football like many Alabamians have. On TV, when they play a ball game, when they're about to air a ball game, they start with a pregame show and a postgame show. Now, I'm not a sports fan. I've never watched a pregame show. It's on my bucket list to never watch one, okay? 
But I have seen the TV programs crank on, and sometimes hours before the game, if it's a big game, they start the pregame show. And then they have a postgame show. Like if you miss something between the last six hours, they're going to tell you what you missed. And, and the truth of the matter is, they'll spend more time talking about the ball game than it even took to play the ball game. But imagine if you would please a real fan. I'm talking about a real sports fan. And he knows what time the game starts and he knows what time the pregame show starts. And so he's done everything that he could do to make everything suitable and prepared. He's called Direct TV. He's had him come out, check his remote control, his TV. I mean, everything. He called Lazy Boy. They've come out, they've oiled the chair, they've got the handle so that it works just fine. He's got the colors on. I mean, uh, whatever his team is, he's got, he's got the jersey. He's got, if we were to check down to the skivvies, I mean, he's, 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 he's decked in the colors of his team. He's invited his friends over. They're going to watch the game together. He's told them, if you can't be here on time, don't you dare ring the doorbell. Don't you dare call. You only walk through the doors during the commercial. I mean, it's time for the game. We're watching the game. And when, when, when the pregame show starts, I mean, when the credits start to scroll, he's there and he's watching it. He's hanging on every single word. He laughs at every joke. Anytime the commentary, commentator says something negative about his team, his coach, his water boy, he gets upset. He throws a soft drink at him. I mean, this is his goal. He's there because the game is going to be played. His friends all finally filter in. They watch the pregame show together. He's watching right up until the time when they flip the, the coin to see who's going to kick and who's going to receive. And as soon as the coin hits the ground, he jars his lazy boy to the ground. He picks up the remote control. He turns off the TV set. He gets up, starts gathering his stuff to walk out the game, uh, out of the room. All of his friends start saying, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, where are you going? Game's on. Where are you, what are you doing? He said, oh, I don't watch the game. I never watch the game. I just watch the pregame show. I'm all about the pregame show. You say, how stupid. How stupid. Nobody's just going to watch the pregame show. I want you to listen to what I'm about to say. You and I have not yet lived one single day of life. We haven't lived one single day of life yet. This is just the pregame show. Amen. You don't actually start living life until you walk through the gates of what we call death. And then life begins. You know what the problem with most humanity is? We're focused on the pregame show. And we've never understood the game doesn't start until we leave this life. Could I tell you? We do need to fear death, but not for the reasons that the world fears death. You say, preacher, why then should we fear death? One reason we should fear death is because it could come at any moment. Sometimes God is gracious and he gives us some advance notice. Sometimes it's as quick as a heart failing to beat a beat. And the truth is, no matter how well prepared we are, we really don't know when it's going to come. It always seems to come without much advance notice. Second reason we should fear death is because once we die, we're going to see God. That judge that we were talking about in the book of Revelation, chapter number one, as soon as you close your eyes in this life, saved or lost, you're going to find yourself standing before that fearsome judge. Therefore, you really ought to have a healthy fear of death. But the third and the biggest reason why you ought to fear death is because after you die, you can't get saved. Whatever decision you had made concerning Jesus Christ, Death seals that decision for all eternity. Hebrews 9, 27, for it is appointed and a man wants to die. And after that, the judgment. There are some things that we ought to fear. We ought to fear God. We ought to fear hell. And if we're not saved, we ought to fear death. There are other things that we ought to fear. Number four, we ought to fear a false profession of faith. Uh, it's not just the rebelliously lost that ought to have fears. It's also the supposedly saved that ought to have fears. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, verse number 1, the writer says, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. Uh, that verse might not make much sense to you, but the writer of the book of Hebrews is talking about the Jews that came out of the land of Egypt. Uh, they were all Israelites. They all went through the sea together. They were all following God. They were all following Moses. They all went through the same trials. They all went through the same troubles. 
And yet the writer is saying that as they marched through the wilderness, it became obvious that not all of them were believers. Not all of them were followers of the true God. And he makes this statement, you need to fear lest you've come up short of entering into the eternal rest that God offers. I don't know of a thing that would be more frightening than for you to think that you're a Christian and then to die and have to stand before God and find out you're lost. The surprise, the shock, the utter despair of realizing it's too late now to make sure. I was a person who once made a profession of faith but did not receive Jesus Christ as my Savior. And this morning, if I were to ask, I suspect there would be a good percentage of people in this sanctuary this morning who first prayed a prayer that did no good. And it wasn't until after they had been in church for a while, been trying to do right for a while, that they realized there was no change in their life. And they finally trusted Jesus Christ on their second request or even their third request at being saved. Now, it's not that you can be saved and lose it. It's just that some people pray prayers and they don't mean what they have prayed. Could I give you a threefold test? Here's a way. Here's a way. I think it's a sure shot way. A sure way that you can find out whether you are a, a true professor of Jesus Christ or a false professor of Jesus Christ. Number one in the test. If you like, excuse me, if you want to deliberately sin, if you want to deliberately sin, there's something wrong with your salvation. Now, I'm not saying that Christians don't sin. The truth is we as Christians do sin. But it should never be the desire of a Christian to sin on purpose. If there's something in your heart that you've been wanting to do and you know it's a wrong thing to do, you need to look deep in your heart and question whether or not you know Jesus Christ is your Savior or not. Because that's a sign that something is wrong. Number two, the second test that you can give yourself, if you are deliberately sinning. If you've moved beyond the stage of wanting to do it, and you're actually doing it, then my friend, that's even worse. It's one thing to have the desire in your heart, but now if you've actually begun to act on this deliberate sin against God. You know that what you're doing is wrong, but you're going to do it anyway. You better check your salvation because there's something wrong on the inside. And number three, the third test that I would encourage you to give yourself, if you're enjoying your deliberate sin against God, if you want to deliberately sin, if you are deliberately sin, if you're enjoying your deliberate sin, my friend, those three things ought to settle the, es the issue of your salvation once and for all. If you are sinning and enjoying it, quit calling yourself a Christian. Because the Bible makes it pretty clear that God won't let one of his children do that. That he will treat them like a father would treat a child. He'll take them out to the woodshed and he'll spank them. And the Bible says if you don't have that spanking, then you're not really his child. The Bible uses the word, our King James Bible, you're a bastard. And now we've used that word as a, as a word of profanity. But what it means is you're a child that doesn't know your father. That's what the word bastard means. It's a child that doesn't know his father. It's not profanity. It was, a, it was a description. And what the Bible is saying is you can sin and God doesn't spank you for it. You don't have God as your father. Listen to me. You ought to fear. You ought to fear a false profession of faith. Number five and last. We ought to fear sin. We ought to fear sin. Peter, in the book of 1 Peter, chapter number 1, verse number 17 says, Pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. Pass the time of your journey here on this earth in fear. Why would Peter say that? Why would he say as we live on this earth there ought to be some measure of fear inside of us? It's because as long as we live in this earth in these physical bodies, we're going to have to fight the battle against sin. And we ought to fear sin. Unfortunately, in the age that we live in, in the world that we live in, in the churches that we're going to today, most people are taught, don't be afraid of sin. Not what the Bible teaches. 
Many people today are trying to make a pet out of this awful thing called sin. Now there's a story, I don't know whether it's a true story or not. The story is as old as the hills. I've actually told the story before, but it's been many years since I've told it. I've learned that some things can get so old that they actually become new to the next generation. So I'm going to tell the story, and I don't know if it's true or not, but it is a story. It's the story of a man who made a pet out of a boa constrictor. A boa constrictor is a snake. It's a big snake. Boa constrictors can grow to be 15 feet long. They do bite, but their deadliness is not in their bite. They might make you sick, but typically they don't have venom that kills their victim. What they are is they're super strong snakes, and the way they kill is by wrapping themselves around their victim and crushing the life out of them. And then they've got mouths so big, so large, that once they release their victim, they can simply engulf their entire victim without even biting it or chewing it up into pieces. They can swallow rabbits whole. They can swallow goats, sheep, wolves whole. Even been said that they can sh swallow deer whole. The story goes that a man found a boa constrictor when it was so small animal, decided to make a pet out of it. It was so small that in the beginning he would let him wrap himself around his fingers, this boa constrictor, just a small little pet. It would wrap him around his fingers. And he taught the snake when he snapped his fingers to release the grip and go away. And so he had trained the snake, started wrapping himself around the face. He got bigger. He began to wrap himself around his whole hand. He got bigger. He began to wrap himself around the arm. And it was a game. Every time the snake would do this, he'd snap his fingers. Eventually, the snake would, snake would release him and go back off someplace. Eventually, he got too big to even wrap around his arms, so he put him on the ground and let him start wrapping around his legs. And he'd wrap up to his middle section, and he began to invite his friends over, come see what my snake can do. And always, he'd snap his fingers, and when he snapped the fingers, the snake would release and go back to his corner. Eventually, he got bigger and bigger. It's a 15-foot-long snake wrapped all the way up around his chest. Eventually, he got so big that basically it was a boa constrictor circle, and his arms were just simply hanging out, and he'd snap his fingers, and whenever he'd snap his fingers, the boa constrictor would release him and go back to his corner. But one day, one day the boa constrictor wrapped around him, and he was showing his friends, and he snapped his fingers, and the boa constrictor didn't release him. He just supposed the boa constrictor didn't hear him, so he snapped again a little bit louder couple of times. And then he realized the hard truth. He had heard the snap. He just wasn't releasing him. And then for some reason, unknown to anyone, the boa constrictor began to do what the boa constrictors do. He began to squeeze the life out of that man. You could hear his screams, but there was nobody prepared to do anything to the snake because he was his pet. He had done it many times before and nothing could be done until finally he had squeezed the life out of the man who owned the boa constrictor. You say, is that a true story? I don't know. It sounds like a story that somebody would have tempted fate with to see if it would happen. But the truth of the matter is there's just some things you ought to be afraid of. One's a boa constrictor. But one even more, we ought to be afraid of sin. You might think sin is your pet. You might think what you do on your computer, what you do in the back waters of your mind. You might think what you do when nobody else is watching. You might think what you enjoy doing. You might think it's all all right, but I'm going to tell you, sin's like a boa constrictor. You treat it like a pet for a while, but it will do to you what it does to everybody else. What does sin do? Sin kills. Why does sin kill? Because that's what sin does. There are some things the Bible teaches us we should fear. 365 fear knots maybe, but right smack dab in the middle of verse number 28, there's something we should fear. What should we fear? We should fear God. We should fear hell. We should fear death. We should fear a false profession of faith, and we should fear sin. Now, let me ask you a question this morning. I know you've got fears. I started the message this morning with a question. What are you afraid of? I, I, I don't really want you to answer that audibly. All of us have fears. If you don't have fears, there's something wrong with you. All of us have fears question I have is, do you fear the right things? Do you fear the things that God tells us that we ought to be afraid of? And have you done what you need to do to rectify all of those fears? What you need to do is you need to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. Jesus Christ, God's Son, came into this world to die on the cross. He didn't come because He had to. He came because He wanted to. He didn't come because He must. He came because He loved he came to die 
for my sins and he came to die for your sins. And when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he had done no wrong. He had on his mind Carl Hall. He had on his mind you. He was dying for you. And this morning, if you would like to be saved, you can. You say, well, preacher, I've done some bad things. You don't know what all I've done. I don't, and I don't want to know, but God does, and he doesn't care because Jesus' death paid for them all. This morning, if you'll do two things, God will save you. Two things. Not just one, but two things. If, number one, you'll believe what the Bible says about Jesus Christ, that he is God, that he came to this world lived a sinless life, died on the cross for you, and on the third day arose. If you'll believe that if you ask him, he'll save you. If you'll believe these things, you can be saved. Now listen to me real, real, real careful here. That's what I did as a 16, no, excuse me, as a 14-year-old boy. But it didn't save me. Just believing doesn't save anybody. Just believing doesn't save anybody. There's two things you've got to do to be saved. Number one, you've got to believe, but number two, you've got to repent. Jesus said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. You can believe everything that the Bible says about Jesus. You can be my greatest amener during church. But if you don't surrender yourself to Jesus Christ, your believing will not save you. In this part of the country, Bible Belt, Alabama, most people still believe that Jesus is God. Most people still believe that he died on the cross, that he rose the third day. If all it takes to go to heaven is believing, most people in Alabama are going to heaven. But it don't take just believing. It also takes some repenting. And that's why we've got a lot of religious folks that are still going to hell. And this morning you might have wandered into this church. You might be the most religious person I have ever met. But if you've not surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, you're going to the same hell that God created for the devil. And that ought to frighten you. This morning, I'd like to invite you to come to Jesus Christ, to have your sins forgiven, to be a part of God's family. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to preach to these folks. I thank you for the ability to preach. I thank you for the word to preach from. I thank you for the people. Now I pray that you speak to every heart. I pray that anybody that's here that's not saved would recognize their condition and surrender themselves to you. And I pray for the Christians that are engaging in sin. Lord, I pray that you'd show them that that's not something that they ought to be doing. Speak to hearts, change lives. We'll do our best to give you the praise. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, we've got two that are supposed to be baptized this morning. I'm going to let you slip on out. I'll be with you in just a few moments. For the rest... If you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, this is the time. This is the moment. This is the time. Would you mind, nobody else is looking, but would you mind sharing with me that you've never trusted Jesus and you know you've never trusted him? You slip your hand up and say, Preacher, would you pray for me this morning? Would you just hold it up? For, I won't come to you. I won't embarrass you. But I do want to try to pray for you and I want to try to help you. Anybody, anywhere, be honest and say, I've never, ever trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. Father, this is your church. We're your people. By the absence of hands, people have testified that they are saved. I pray, God, that they all are. Now, you speak to hearts. You direct this service, and we'll do our best to be obedient to you. Surrender ourselves to you now, for we ask it in Jesus' name.